let me introduce to you Kelly Nissen from Just Right Words. Hello everybody, how are you? And thank you for, for helping me out in this way, Kelly, because it's the, it's the really important matter of how to take the ideas that you've got out of your head and onto the page mm. and then polish them up like a diamond. And this is exactly what someone like Kelly does. So Kelly, can I start by asking you to, we'll perhaps go from the outside in, in terms of the complexity of the work that you do. So would you just kick off for us and I'll jump in with any questions if I think you might be going a little too fast or you might have missed something, if that's okay. Mm, yes, or if I've gone off track, which happens quite a lot. So All right, then. Um, I'll, I'll just preface this everybody by saying there's a reason why I edit and I write and it's because I'm not a massive fan of public speaking and that sort of thing. So um, writing affords you that opportunity to be able to go back later with later and fix, you know, all the little errors and, and everything. Whereas speaking, once it's out there, it's out there and there's no, no pause or delete button. Um, anyway, in terms of, of what I do, my, my range is, is quite broad. So I know a lot of people um, who are perhaps writing a book for the first time or haven't um, actually written a book um, and, you know, might be thinking about it. When they come to think about editing, a lot of people think, oh, okay, so if I need my work edited, um, I write it and then I get somebody to come and fix all my spelling mistakes and, you know, my punctuation and my grammar and blah, 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 and then my work's edited. But really, um, that's probably the smallest stage and maybe one of the most important but the smallest stage of what I do and it's right at the end of the process so if we're talking about going from the very broad um, the big picture um, editing what we're starting with there is the um, probably the editorial assessment I would say or the manuscript appraisal um, which in itself is not actually an edit in that um, you'll get, you'll send me um, clients will send me the, their manuscript, um, but I won't and I'll read it obviously. But I won't actually put any comments directly onto the manuscript in track changes. I'm not going to make any changes on your manuscript. What I'll do is I'll read it, and then I'll give you a general appraisal about what's working in the manuscript and what's not working and some concrete ideas for what you might want to change and how you could possibly change them. Not that that is, you know, the be all and end all. That's my suggestion. The, the probably the most frustrating yet the most joyful thing about the whole editing process is that it's, it is very subjective. So you might take your work to one editor, and they'll say, oh, yes, you, you really need to fix, you know, this aspect of things like your character development if you're writing fiction or your, your structure um, if you're writing nonfiction is, you know, not quite right. But then the next editor will say, no, that's perfect. You actually need to fix this. What it boils down to is that any advice that an editor gives you on any stage, except perhaps for your spelling and punctuation and those little secretarial aspects, any advice that they give you is subjective. It is their opinion. It is based on their background knowledge, which in many cases is quite extensive. But at the end of the day, you're the author and it's your decision and it's your words and they're your ideas. So you need to be comfortable that what you're producing and what you're sending in or publishing at the end of the day, that you're comfortable with it and you don't feel that you need to please the editor. So you don't want to feel that, um, that an editor that you're working with, if you don't accept half of their suggestions that the editor will go, oh, I'm so offended, I'm heartbroken, you know, you really should do that, I'm never going to work with you again. Um, where we're putting suggestions out there and if you don't agree with them that's absolutely your right to not agree with them so in going back to the manuscript appraisal or the editorial assessment that's the other thing about editing there are like 50 different names for every every different thing so i'll use one you'll hear the same thing from somebody else um yeah it's, it's so if you if you're ever unsure please ask but the manuscript appraisal 
I might give you six or seven suggestions on different things to change and you might go, yep, I absolutely agree with that one. I'm going to work on changing that. But those other two things that she said, no, I don't agree with that. I, I think that'll change my voice. I think that'll change my content or my message. You don't have to do that at all. It's entirely up to you as to what you change and how you change it. Um, with your manuscript appraisal as well, I said that that was really the first stage. You might not do that at all. Your manuscript appraisal really is early on. It might You might choose to get an appraisal at the end of your first or second draft, or even when you're not finished, you might be halfway through, you might have um, just done sort of an outline of your remaining chapters. Um, what the appraisal will do will say, hey, yeah, you're on track. Yes, I think this is good. Oh, you might want to change this. Um, you know, you're not quite ready for the really deep feedback, but you're not sure. You so, you know, sometimes when you're, when you're writing something, you've got these great ideas, but then you feel like your wheels are spinning. I don't know if any, I feel like that constantly, but you feel like your wheels are spinning <laughs> and that you can't, you're like, oh, I don't want to get this idea out, but nothing I do is working. Um, I don't think I'm getting the message, I'm repeating myself, blah, blah, blah. That's the time for a manuscript appraisal right then. Um, just to touch base with somebody, give your work to somebody else with some other eyes and some fresh ideas and, you know, ask for what, what you want. So manuscript appraisal is your first one. Shall I keep going, Jane? Yes, with please. The, that, was, yes. that was, I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Yeah, so so. I, it's taken me quite a while actually to sort this out really clearly in, in my own head and be able to talk about it. And I, I will admit to it, I have cheat sheet notes here as well. <laughs> so yeah, really. just, you see me looking down all the time. That's A, I'm never sure where to look on a Zoom thing, but B, I'm just checking to make sure I'm not giving you the wrong information. So once you've actually finished your manuscript, you might have redrafted it a few times and you just, you need somebody else to, to have a look at it and to tighten it up, you know, look at it in the big picture sense. Um, I was talking to somebody just yesterday, actually, who's, she said, oh, I've worked this and worked this and worked this and, you know, it's been through five drafts. I'm still not quite sure. I need to get it out and give it to somebody else just for fresh eyes. When you're at that stage and you and you think, you know, you've done everything you can, that would be the time to get, now these have got multiple names, a structural edit is how I refer to them. Um, they're also with a lot of older editors, um, they still call them a substantive edit, which I think probably, you know, is related to being substantial because it's, you know, quite a big, big task. And there's also some people refer to these edits as developmental edits. So the word I'm going to use is structural. Um, but if you've heard developmental before, essentially there are little differences, but most people these days seem to be lumping all those differences under the one banner that's structural editing. So with your structural editing, Again, like your manuscript appraisal, you send your entire manuscript and usually a synopsis is, is good to send to the editor as well if you've got one of those. So just, you know, the beginning to end of what you've written, um, the synopsis, we can talk about those later, they're the, probably the hardest thing to write ever. Um, but so a, a structural edit will give you overall feedback on the structure of of your your manuscript whether it's fiction or non-fiction or it could be a business ebook or whatever you happen to be doing it's the the structure so you might say to the editor with the structural doing the structural edit oh you know i'm not quite sure whether my sequencing flows properly you know i think i should swap some chapters around blah blah blah, blah. if you're writing um fiction you might you might not be sure whether or not your, your characters are consistent or there's massive big plot holes where the reader's going to go, hey, how did that happen? And who's that person? And, you know, did, didn't they, you know, have these characteristics before or this personality before? Um, 
the structural editor will give you again an idea of what works and what doesn't work but there's significantly more detail in a in a structural edit so the the editor will go in to a lot more areas than a manuscript appraisal and they will give you a lot a lot more quite a substantial amount um, of suggestions and um, positive feedback as well as constructive feedback it's really important if you don't ever get positive feedback from an editor they're not doing their job just saying um, everybody's got something great about what they've written so yeah always look for the positive and it should come first um, with your structural edit what you will get or you should get and again this depends on the editors so make sure whoever you happen to be going with make sure that they're very clear in the outset about what their structural edit includes. So for me, my structural edit will include an editorial report or an appraisal. So it's similar to the manuscript appraisal, except more detailed. So it might be six pages instead of three. Um, plus there'll be annotations in the track changes form on your manuscript because if you've got quite a long manuscript or even if you've got quite a short one sometimes it can be difficult if you only get the annotations you have to scroll through to find out what the editor said you're scrolling through and you're scrolling back and that sort of thing if you are looking at those annotations in the comments in conjunction with the editorial report it's easier to pinpoint those those changes so if you're if the editor has said to you and if you're writing fiction um you your character is not as believable as they could be they will give you an example of where you've done it well and where you could improve okay so a structural editor is not going to say to you hey, you need to improve this and here's how you should do it. They're never going to rewrite anything for you. That's not their job. They're going to say to you, I think you could possibly improve it here by adding more detail about this. Or if you're writing a non-fictional business, you didn't really explain this particular concept. I think you, maybe you should go in and have an ex extra section where you explain this or you go into the background first. Or they could be, you know what, you've said this now three times in three different parts of the book. Perhaps think about deleting, you know, a couple of them. My suggestion would be this one. So again, it's always should be couched as my suggestion is, not you must. And don't ever think you must do something. Because again, it's it's your book, your writing, your ideas. Um, what else was I going to say on that? So your structural edit, yep, yeah, is you've like I said, you're focusing on, on structure, your ideas, um, if your fiction, your plot, your character inconsistencies or, you know, where you've done it well, basically what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Um, is that, have I covered all of that? I feel like I've forgotten to say something. There. Oh, look, it sounds to me like an incredibly comprehensive uh, yeah. on, on what people can expect. And I do appreciate you going into so much detail, Kelly. Mm. That's just so helpful. Okie dokie. Um, just as a little aside, then you also um, have a form, it's sort of editing. Um, it's a beta read. So I don't know if people have, have heard of that. I think it's becoming a little bit more well known. So there are people out there who are, they just do beta reading. Okay, so your beta reader, they're going to focus on giving you feedback from the reader's perspective. So not from an edit editing perspective at all. Um, the thing about your beta readers is that really to be effective, they need to read prolifically in that particular genre, if you're writing fiction, or they need to have a lot of business um, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, experience in that particular um, business um, that you might be writing about. So for me, I'll just give you some examples because it's probably easier. Um, for me, I offer beta reading services. 
um, for anybody who's writing about autism or special needs or and particularly education so dealing with or responding to um, autism from an educational perspective because that's my background I was a teacher for 25 years I worked not exclusively with special needs students but with a lot of them and my son is autistic so I'm I can I'm, I'm quite opinionated about that too but I've also read quite widely so I feel comfortable with doing a beta read for somebody in that in that area um, if you're writing a book about you know, writing tips, author life, blah, 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 blah. I, I will do that. What I, what I can't do is, for example, if you send me a manuscript and it's all about war history um, or any history, history is not really not my thing, I can't do a beta read, a beta read on that. I can, I can give you a structural edit on that, but not a beta read because I don't read widely in that, in that genre. Okay, science fiction, definitely not. <laughs> it's not my thing. In fact, I would probably be reluctant to um, do a structural edit on science fiction too, because it's got a very specific structure that you follow, and I would prefer to give that to somebody else. So, your beta reader or your beta editor is going to look at reader's perspective. Does it engage the reader? There is it boring? Is it repetitive? Have we seen it before? Is it done to death? Okay, but most of all, you know, is, is this going to be a joy to read? If, if I saw it in a bookshop, would I purchase it to read? Is really what your beta reader is, is looking for there. Now, before you move on, Kelly, mm. this one really seems to have been of interest to people because I've got yes. not one, I've got three questions in the chat box. So I, I saw them, look. I saw them pop <laughs> up actually. And, and I'm just like, oh, question, focus. Yes. And I forgot question. what I wanted to say. So the first one is how to do a beta read. I'll read them all. Yep. Oh, sorry, one of the comments is me where I say I'll ask Kelly. <laughs> Two, you've got two questions here. So the one is how to do beta reading. So yep. someone's been asked to do that for, for somebody. Right. At what stage do the beta readers come in? Is it after the structural edit? Um, really, it depends on what level of advice that you want. So I'll go to that question first because it's the freshest and then I'll probably ask you what you asked the first time. <laughs> um, it, it's the same, it probably around about the same stage we, that you would ask for your manuscript appraisal I think so you can ask for it just in that first draft form and in fact I, I had somebody do that because she she felt she was stuck so she'd written a um, an art-based historical fiction thriller thing nothing nothing's a single genre anymore um, it was fantastic but she sent it to me as a beta reader a, because I was familiar with her work because I'd edited her work before so I understood her style of writing. But B, because I love reading that sort of thing. Anything that's thriller with a bit of truth in it, like a historical component, I'm there. They're the sort of books that I read. Um, so she sent it to me after she'd written the first draft. And then since I did that beta read, because what, what she basically wanted to know was, what do you reckon? Do you, do you think I've got a story here? So you don't want to spend, and it doesn't matter whether you're writing fiction, non-fiction, business books, whatever, you want to know whether or not you should actually persist in writing that book because writing a book or in a particular style, it takes a lot of time. It's not something you can just, you know, whip out and do really quickly. Um, so, and you don't want to spend a lot of time drafting, redrafting, redrafting if you really haven't hit the mark at the outset. So I'd be looking for a beta read really early on. Okay. And you might not, you might not even want to do that. If you're, if you're confident that what you've got is going to hit the mark or it's something you just really want to say. Okay. If it's something you really want to say, you go for it. Absolutely go for it. Um, but if you're, if you're wavering, you think, oh, you know, has this been done before? Have I got something new to say? Blah, blah, blah. Get somebody to do a beta read for it for you. Um, a, they're much cheaper than a structural assessment. 
um, a structural edit, and B, it gives you that reader's perspective, which really at the end of the day, doesn't matter what your editor thinks about your book, it's what the readers are going to think about your book. So it is important information to, to have. Um, that being said, an editor who does beta reading as well, they can beta read it for you at the start if they offer that service, and then you can send it to them later for the structural because they do look at different things. Um, what I'll jump in with also is that um, with my authors, we, we do it in a particular way. Mm. So because they have the certainty of the structure that we've set up together yeah. and with able to bounce things off me and send things to me, they have that certainty about this is the book that's being written yes. with the end purpose in mind. Mm. And we'll hit the mark. So they're often at the stage where they think they're finished. Yeah. You know, they feel this, they're done, they can do no more. And then a beta reader comes in really, really handy. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because the beta reader will say to you, and they're very honest as well, they'll say to you, yeah, you know what, you've got a complete package here or, oh, I was sort of missing mm. this bit of information and that sort of thing. So there is a crossover definitely between a beta read and a structural edit or a beta read and a manuscript assessment, but your beta reader really, they're not giving you any editorial advice. They're giving you 100% pure opinion. I like it, I don't like it, and here's why. And then, then they might give you advice on, you know, uh, you know, this character just seemed to me, seemed a little bit flat. Um, you know, this, this character here, or your main character, Again, I keep going to fiction, but that's my um, sort of the thing I'm, my headspace is in at the moment. Your main character is not believable or not likable, um, which is always a, a death sign in fiction. Um, or, but even with your business stuff, it's like, oh, actually, oh, here we go. I've just written a LinkedIn post today about jargon. Um, just a little short one. Fantastic. In your yes, I was just I was sitting here waiting for this to start, and I'm like J J. I can't think of a J word. J J J, and then jargon. But with um with your beta reader, they might also notice in your business book or whatever if you've used a whole stack of jargon because it's within your industry, but not necessarily jargon that's used for the consumers of your, your service or your product, your beta reader will be able to say to you, hey, you know what? A lot of the people reading your book probably are going to be just bamboozled by your jargon. So they are, a beta reader is awesome at picking up jargon or terminology that in your mind you think, yeah, you know, that's normal, I use it all the time. But the person on the street, maybe not. And that happens a lot. Um, if you're writing anything in education, there is so much jargon um, that teachers use and they don't realise it when they're writing reports and they send something home to a parent and the parent's like, oh, okay, the child got a C, great, but they don't really understand what was written because there's been jargon that's been used. So, yeah, jargon is something that's really, really good for a beta And I think, too, probably a beta reader is going to pick up your jargon more than your structural editor, I think, depending on their, their background and experience. So. That's interesting. And there was someone just asking for clarification about the difference between an appraisal and a beta reader. Yeah. So a pra your appraisal, if we look at an appraisal as a manuscript appraisal or an editorial assessment, that's the editor's side of things and they will look for editing aspects so they'll look for your structure they'll look for your characterization they'll look for your um you know your use of, of language and that sort of thing whereas your beta reader purely from the reader's perspective so and a lot of readers like if you look on facebook these days and in the newspaper and that sort of thing it would appear that nobody cares less anymore about spelling and structure and paragraphing and that sort of thing because they don't get editors to do it. Um, forgotten what point I was going to make there, but um, with your, your, your beta reader, they're not going to be focused 
on that. They're not going to be focused on whether you've used the same word 15 times in two paragraphs. They're focused purely on your content and whether it's interesting, engaging and hits the mark with your message. Gotcha. And then I think the only other question we've got on this is how, how to be a beta reader. Yeah. Um, if somebody, no, because somebody said that they'd been asked to be a beta well, reader. Well, that's me just reading into Oh, the right. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, pretty much anybody can be a beta reader. Um, a lot of authors of any genre ask their family to read their book and give them feedback, that's a really bad idea. Um, because your family, they love you and they're gonna say, yeah, it's great. Um, so if you, if you are asked to be a beta reader, um, you really, it, like I said before, it needs to be content or a genre or a theme that you are very familiar with, that you either read a lot of, you've got a lot of experience in it um, and that sort of thing. Um, and when you're looking for a beta reader, I would be looking to find out whether they do have that experience and, and get them, ask them to prove it, that they've got that experience because you don't, for example, you wouldn't want to send a work of science fiction to me for a beta read because I don't like that genre at all and your the comments are going to not be very positive. So you, you, you're looking for somebody who's not going to tell you everything is wonderful, you want constructive feedback, but also you want to know that they know what they're talking about mm. as well. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. So look, we're moving right along here. So we've covered the appraisal, we've covered yep. structural editing, we've talked about better reading. Mm. So this is all the big stuff. That's right, what's Out next? Okay, should we keep going yeah. down the pile? Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you've got all that big stuff out of the way, and I'll do, I'll do my little analogy now, and I think I might have stolen this from somebody, but it's really cool and it, it helps, I think. All of those things, whether it's the manuscript appraisal, the structural edit, or the, even the beta read, if you think when you're building a house, um, you start with the frame of the house. So you start with the scaffolding and the framework, the skeleton of the house, you need that concrete, whatever you call it, the flooring area in, and you need the roof, okay? So all of those things that hold up the frame of your house, that's your structural edit, okay? Or your manuscript appraisal or your, your beta read. So you can't, you can't build a house without knowing that the structure is going to hold everything up. So that's that side of things done. Um, the next part of editing is your copy edit. Okay, also sometimes referred to in older lingo as uh, line editing. And there is a very slight difference between the two, but mostly now you'll hear most people talk about a copy edit. Um, and it's actually two words, not one, copy edit. Um, although sometimes you'll see it written together like in some of the things I've written in the past. Um, so with your copy edit, if you think about the house, You've got your structure, it's done. Your copy edit is your putting in the electricity workings, putting in the plumbing, um, putting up the walls and the windows and that sort of thing and closing it all in because you don't want the wind to blow through. So your copy edit in editing terms, I'll start, it's the spelling, the grammar and the punctuation. Your structural editor is not going to look at that. Okay, so if you get your work back from a structural editor and you know you've made spelling mistakes in that work, don't expect them to have corrected it because that's not their job. That's the copy editor's job. So it's the spelling, the grammar, the punctuation. A copy editor will also look intimately at your word use. So I think I mentioned before, you've used the same word 15 times in two paragraphs um, and you don't realise that because you know what you've what you've said in your head and you don't necessarily see it on the page, but it is very jarring. So the copy editor will say, hey, I see this word and they'll highlight it for you. You've used this X number of times. How about you think of a different way to say it? How about you replace it with a synonym, whatever. They'll also look at your word use for clarity. So if you've used a word that doesn't really mean quite what you think it means in that context, 
your copy editor will flag that for you. They might even offer you, like I do, I offer quite a few options as well, but you don't have to choose any of those options. Okay, and again, it's entirely up to you whether you choose to take that advice. Um, the copy editor will check for inconsistencies in your work. So if you're writing fiction, and this happens, your main character in the first three chapters have got, has got blue eyes and then all of a sudden their eyes are brown. Okay, so that little inconsistency that your copy editor will pick up, sometimes the structural editor will, will as well if the eyes are a big thing. Um, other inconsistencies like if you're writing um, business books, you might have spelled a particular product name or a particular service with a capital letter in half of the book and then with a lowercase letter in the other half. So the copy editor is going to say, hey, you need to make a decision between these two. Um, it's your decision because it's your, your book, um, but make sure it's consistent all the way through. They'll, a copy editor will look at the tense, so present tense, past tense, and also the point of view. So um, a lot of self-help style books are written very much from the first person point of view. So they're, the people who write these are drawing, drawing the reader in by saying, hey, you know what? I've experienced this. I'm, I'm telling you my story and my hope to actually help you um, with something else. So it's very easy when you're looking at your point of view to slip in between and jump between writing in the first person. So that's the I and the me and the my. And then all of a sudden jumping into third person, she, he, they um, as well. So it's really important in fiction to keep your point of view stable but it's just as important in non-fiction and um, business style books and self-help books to make sure that that is consistent because for the reader it can be just and they might not realize it but it can be that little thing that's a little bit jarring that takes them away from the message that you're trying to give um, so the copy editor will definitely flag those things and give you suggestions for how you can how you can change that which point of view might be better um, they'll look at numbers and numbering systems. So all of the style manual type um, type things. Um, at the end of the day, what the copy editor's brief, I suppose, is that your writing is as strong as it can be and it says and means what you want it to be. So your copy editor is also going to look for anything that's a bit ambiguous. Okay, so and there's a lot of ambiguities out there. If you, if you Google um, ambiguous signs, there are some really funny ones <laughs> on Google in the images, um, and you think, oh, you often don't think of it because when you've written it, you're like, yeah, that, that's fine. I, I know what I meant. But if if your reader reads it, they're like, oh, and particularly in business emails, oh, did they actually mean this? Or did they mean this? It's where a lot of misunderstanding happens. Um, so your copy editor is, is very good for that. Um, also, the style, the flow of your writing, does it, does it flow seamlessly from one thing to another? Or is it like you've just plonked different chapters or different, if you're making a salad, is your is your writing a bowl of lettuce, a bowl of tomato, and a bowl of cucumber, or is it all nicely mixed in like this awesome sort of Buddha bowl that my daughter made last night for dinner, and it all looked very pretty, but it all worked together. Um, so your copy editor is going to look at the flow of your of your writing and the flow of your chapters and that sort of thing, and your voice. This is so so important. Um, somebody asked me yesterday, actually, so she said to me. She said, I'm really nervous about getting my work edited. And she was just at the copy editing stage. She says, I'm so nervous about getting it edited because I'm so scared that the editor is going to change my voice and it won't sound like me anymore. If any editor changes your voice and makes their, your writing, so it could be your sentence structure, it could be the words you use, if they've changed it so much that you look at that writing and go, I couldn't have written that. That doesn't sound like me. You honestly, I'll tell you now, you need to actually get rid of them and find somebody who maintains your voice. So 
the best writing, particularly in business ebooks or in self-help books or in memoir, it needs to, when you're reading it or when somebody else is reading it, it, they need to say, oh my God, that sounds exactly like Jane. That's the way she talks. I can hear her voice in my head while I'm reading it. That's what your, your copy editor needs to maintain. So if you get, if, if the copy editor comes along and they rewrite sentences for you, don't take that because they're changing it to their writing style. Um, whereas your writing style might be perfectly fine. Okay. Because it's the way you write and it's your book. Um, that's probably the biggest, the biggest thing I'm really, really quite passionate about maintaining people's voice and partly because I've had my voice changed in, in edits um, and didn't realize it until years later. And also because I know I have done that to people in the past and I feel awful about it and they called me on it rightly so, but I am very, very conscious that I do not do that um, anymore. And if I do, I want people to tell me about it and yeah, can't impress enough. Don't accept everything as gospel that you hear from, from an editor because it's opinion and yes. subjective. Indeed. Yeah. So that's copy editing then. Yes. Mm. Yes. All right. So last one. So you've got your, your house, you've got the frame, you've got the roof, you've got the flooring. Now you've got all the components in your water, your electricity, your gas, whatever, your windows, your doors, your walls are in. But at the moment, this house is, is not quite perfect because you haven't got all the interior design done and you haven't got the garden done. So this is your proofreading. Your proofreading comes right at the end. So in the same when you're doing a house, you're not going to paint the walls of your house and pick your carpet and that sort of thing when the windows aren't in. Okay, so it's, it is very much a process. So your proofreading, the absolute last thing that you get done. And a lot of proofreading, not all of it, but a lot of it is done on hard copy. So it's after your writing has already had the layout done, it's been with the typesetter or whoever's organising it for you. Um, and it's that, it's that polish, it's that interior design, it's making sure that the picture on the wall is hung straight and not slightly crooked or slightly off centre. Um, so again, spelling, punctuation, grammar, it picks up, your proofreader will pick up those little typos and they slip through because if your copy editor does everything for you in tracked changes, lo and behold, you will have two full stops at some point because it doesn't, it's really hard in track changes to make sure you've checked everything. Um, you might have thought, oh, okay, I'm going to move this sentence from here to here. Um, and in the process, in the cut and paste, you missed a word. So you've got this loose word hanging around that you don't realise is there. Your proofreader is going to pick up all those little typos um, for you. Um, I'm not going to say all, let's say 99.9% .9 of them because even the best proofreaders still miss stuff because it's all manual. Um, your proofreader as well, if you ask them to, now some proofreaders do this and some don't, but they will also look at the layout, um, the font consistency. So in, if you've got a whole heap of headings, Maybe your, um, you've used Times New Roman for one heading and then accidentally in one of your other headings, it's in another font that looks similar to Times New Roman but isn't and you haven't picked it up. Or it could be a difference in your text in one section is in 12 point size and in another section it's 11. It's a tiny difference or there's two spaces between a word instead of one. It has all these little things that, you know, you want your book to shine. You want it to be perfect. You don't want those mistakes to slip through. Um, oh, now this is just something I learned the other day, and I bet Jane probably already knows it. There are these things in writing called widows. People heard about widows. Do you know what widows are? No? Okay. So, and you'll notice these now all the time. Oh, I'm so excited because I only learned this the other day. A widow is, if you've got, 
a book and you've got a double page spread or you you're you know when you're in that page turn stage if you have got almost all of a paragraph at the end of the page and then you turn the page and there are two words left uh, never. from that paragraph yes it's called widows i didn't know it was called that but yes yeah. A really good layout artist won't let yes. that happen. Yes, exactly. It's a and, terrible look, yeah. Yeah, so, and sometimes they're also called orphans, but I think I'm guessing the orphans are where you've started a paragraph and you've only got one line of the paragraph at the bottom of the page and the rest, rest of it is on the next page. Perhaps, I'm just guessing, but there's widows and orphans and more and more now they're, they're sort of creeping in because less and less people seem to care about it. But now that I know what they are, I'm seeing them everywhere and it's really annoying. Sort of makes reading really hard when you're just reading for pleasure. Well, <laughs> the thing to be aware of too is that you're thinking these are little things and somebody reading the book, they're not even going to notice. Mm. Uh, true, they may not consciously notice, but unconsciously they will. Yes. And it all adds up if there are, you know, uh, and even in prof really, really professionally published books, uh, you know, your penguins and what have you, it's not uncommon to see a typo. Yes. It yeah. really isn't. However, what none of us can afford to do is have a compounding effect where there's, a, you know, typo here or there. There's one of these widows or orphans. Mm. There's inconsistency with the, the fonts and things. It yep. just leads to a, a sense of, non-professionalism and this yeah. you don't want to invest all that time in writing your wonderful book for little things like that just no. for the sake of possibly saving a little bit of money on you know getting somebody who does this for a living to actually do it mm. which as a matter of fact brings me to a great question that I'm so glad someone has asked this now there's two two parts to this question awesome. <laughs> how long will I need to invest my time to do a proof proofread of my 75,000 word book. Now, you can't do a proofread of your own book. No. The point is you, do, you don't have the fresh eyes to be able to do that, unfortunately. No. You see, I'm like, I don't proofread my own writing either for that very reason. Myself like, either. I would never, I would not trust me as a proofreader at the best of times, let alone for my own writing. Because the thing is, and there has actually been studies done on this, um, that when you've written something, you know what you've written, you know what it's supposed to say. And when you're reading it, your brain translates the words that you've actually written into what you think you've written so sometimes it will take like somebody will have said your know, people have said to me in the past oh you used that same word three times in that same paragraph i'm like no i didn't i checked it and then when you go through and highlight it, it's like oh my god and there's another one um so you you're just so close to your own work you can't actually see that sort of thing and just on that whole proofreading thing um the editor in Microsoft Word doesn't pick everything up, just saying, and neither does Grammarly. Um, there are editing tools out there, and I, you know, as an editor, I use some of these tools, but I don't rely solely on them because, you know, everything, you need that actual eyes to, to look at them. So by all means, definitely run through your writing afterwards to check for things. If you want to proofread your own writing initially before you send it to somebody, print it off and read it in the hard copy form because you'll see it. Um, you'll see those mistakes that you won't have seen on the screen. Or you can actually get make a second copy of your work and change the font. If you change the font to something really different, you're tricking your brain. And your brain can then, you'll see a spelling mistake that you didn't see before in the original font that you've actually typed it in. So I've got a freebie somewhere um, of six tips to actually help you proofread your own writing there as well. But at the end of the day, proofreading your own writing shouldn't be your the only thing that you do when it comes that to... Was the good, that was a good way of answering it. Whereas I said, no, 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 you can't do it. Um, yeah. 
It's a bit hard to answer the question, though. How long would a 75,000-word manuscript Yeah, be? Um, a tricky question. It, it depends on how fast your reading rate is. Mm. So some people read a lot faster than other people. Um, when you're... When you're proofreading too, though, like if you're just reading content and you're reading it for yourself, you don't read every single word, okay, because your brain makes assumptions. In fact, when you've got a word, you don't read the whole word because you, all you need is the beginning and the end of the word and your brain puts it, puts it into place. And I've got an awesome little exercise that I will do with people one day. Um, if you'd like to have a look, it's really cool, but I forgot about it today. Um, so you can t check your reading rate. So for me, so I'm just looking at what I've got written. I can read roughly a thousand words. Um, a couple, yeah, a couple of thousand words or a few pages as as a structural edit in an hour or so, or in half an hour. Um, but when you're proofreading what you're really looking for is word by word. So your proofread can take a lot longer to do as well. So when I'm, when I'm charging for a proofread, I charge on a per word rate rather than a time rate because, uh, yeah, and I, whoever asked that question, I'm so sorry. I honestly cannot answer that for you because it really depends how fast you read, how used you are to sort of scanning text and finding little little things as well so but i would say for most people who aren't who don't do proofreading as a as a regular job it's going to take you quite a while because you do need to almost like you know when kids are learning to read and they stick a ruler underneath their their sent the lines and they just work their way down you're almost doing that as well mm. so i probably didn't give that person the satisfactory answer that they wanted to hear. But I think it was an excellent answer. Oh, thank you, James. Yes. yes. Now, we might be getting close to the time where mm. I, you know, invite people to unmute themselves and ask questions. Mm. But is there more that you want to say here, Kelly, to sort of wrap it all up? Yeah. I, 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 I love your um, lovely house idea. Oh, yeah, I was quite pleased with that. And I'm sure I stole it from somebody else, but I can't remember who. Um, <laughs> probably... Definitely, like, if you go to an editor and you say, you know, how much will it cost me to <laughs> edit my work? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the first thing they're going to ask you is what level of editing do you need? And they're going to want to see a sample. Now, don't be scared about sending that sample and don't send the sample of your best, most polished work, okay? Because you're, all you're doing is you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, Send it along and listen to the editor's advice about, you know, about what you need. So if you think you only need a proofread, but the editor says to you, actually, you need a little bit more than that. There are some structural elements you need, or there are some copy editing elements that you're really missing out on. A, a lot of editors won't give you a proofread if you need that bigger level stuff because they feel they're doing you and themselves a disservice. and yeah, it's just they, they either won't do it or your your work won't be as perfect as it can be. If, if it needs a structural edit and you've only had a proofread done, it, it could go out there and, and not get any sales or, you know, you, you lose um, credibility with, with that sort of thing. So, um, but be prepared. It's editing is, it's not cheap getting your work edited um, at all. Remembering that, the editor is investing a lot of hours, A, in reading your work, but also in, you know, their, their expertise. And they take the time because an editor wants you to have the best work that you possibly can have. And it takes time if they're not going to rush it back to you. And we also need to feed our kids. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, yeah, it is, it, is a, it is an absolute shock, but it's worth it in the end if you want to have the best work that you can have. And most editors, myself included, we will work stuff out with you guys that, to help you in the best way that we possibly can within your budget. Mm -hmm. And what I love about you, Kelly, and why I'm happy to be working with you is that I know you're not going to 
be selling people something they don't need. No, absolutely not. And I've seen this playing out, not needing a structural edit, copy edit, proofread, perfect. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I, don't, I don't also have enough hours in my day to waste my time doing something that doesn't need to be done mm. and wasting your money for something yeah. that doesn't need to be done. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Well, with a lot of my authors, as I said, um, Kelly's doing the proofreading for me now. Mm. I was using somebody else, but Kelly's my go-to person now. Not only the proofreading, but, you know, all, all stages of um, the editing but for the most part my authors are just needing the proofread because mm. I have an obsessiveness <laughs> in terms of working with my clients and a couple of them on the line will know that I jump in like first we structure the book right from the beginning and if, if we stay within the structure and just have a bit of flexibility there then all is going to be good on that front yeah. i can bring fresh enough eyes not fresh enough to do proofreading but fresh enough eyes to be able to see where something isn't resonating properly isn't quite sitting properly but i do this thing that i've now named the three r's it's about rewording rewriting and rearranging yeah. So that's why it's often that you're only going to be seeing the proofread uh, at, at the proofread stage because I say I, I've got this kind of obsessiveness about me and I love it. I love that just jumping in, just doing that bit of a, I call it zhuzhing up to yeah. just do the polishing to the point where it can go to proofreading to get really nice and shiny. Obsessiveness is why you're so good at what you do. Honestly, and so I, you yes, that's somebody. why you're so good at what you do, but you yeah. don't come across as being obsessive. Yes, um, <laughs> I sometimes describe it as being anal, but you know, in a positive way. <laughs> um, I think Kelly, because we've got, of course, the people on the call now, but we've mm -hmm. also got people who'll be listening to this recording. Yep. So, would you spell out your website address for us? Yes, and I'm going to write it down. <laughs> First, well, that's okay. And I was going to say, I'll, al I'll always put these details mm. under the YouTube video when right. I put it up on YouTube. So the details are there, but it's always really great if people, you know, who, who don't want to read, they just like to watch and listen, yeah. um, can also get your details. Okay, so um, my website, oh, Hold five with that one. My website's my old website. My new website is coming, but the old website is still functioning. Um, and it's got the same URL. So it's um, whatever you want to put at the front, www.justrightwords is all one word, but it's J-U-S-T-R-I-G-H-T-W-O-R-D-S. So right as in right and left, not writing. Justrightwords.com.au. And my email address is Kelly with an I-E, so K-E-L-L-I-E at justrightwords.com.au, just to make it easy. Great. And um, look, everybody on this call and everybody who watches this video is more than welcome to have a strategy session with me where any questions that have come up, if I can't answer them, I'll certainly be in touch with Kelly to get the answer for you. Mm. And um, the other thing I want to mention is that for any of you authors who are looking to be able to promote your books, if you are in or near to Sydney, I run author showcase events at the State Library of New South Wales. And I've got my next one coming up on the 13th of March. And the one after that is the 23rd of October. If I get nice and super busy, I'll pop another one in in between those dates. But these are the dates I've got locked in at the moment. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you if you're interested in that. And the way to get in touch with me is Jane, J-A-N-E, at writewithjane.com. And that's the normal way of write. <laughs> <laughs> the actual writing way of writing. Yeah. yeah, but um, it's just been so, so wonderful to connect with you in this way, Kelly, because I thought I knew everything I needed to know about um, editing, but I've learned a lot already. 